Thank you very much. Welcome everyone to today's meeting. It's the um, Adult Health and Active Lifestyle Scrutiny Board. My name is Abigail Marshall Cutting. I'm a councillor representing Little London Woodhouse and the City Centre Ward. I am absolutely delighted and privileged to be your new chair to this board. May I also use this opportunity to acknowledge Councillor Helen Hayden's recent appointment to the Executive Board and to formally thank her on our behalf and the whole entire scrutiny board for her role that she played as the scrutiny chair. So on behalf of all of us, I want to note it, we're saying a big thank you to Councillor Hayden. I will now ask board members to formally introduce themselves in the following alphabetical order. Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Councillor Caroline Anderson. I represent Adeline Wharfdale Ward. Thank you. Dr. Beale. I'm John Beale. Good afternoon. I am a co opting member of this board and I also chair Health Watch Leads. You're welcome. Thank you. Is Councillor Elliot here now? Not yet. All right. Councillor Harrington. Good afternoon. My name's Norma Harrington. I'm the Weatherby Ward Councillor. Thank you very much. Councillor Iqbal, is he here yet? Okay, no problem. Councillor Knight. Good afternoon, Councillor Knight, Wheatwood Ward. Thank you very much, Councillor Latty. Good afternoon, Councillor Graham Latty from Geisley and Rawdon Ward. Thank you very much. We've got Councillor Leigh who will be arriving shortly, so he's not here at the moment. Councillor Raiden. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Denise Reagan, representing Berman Softs and Richmond Hill. Thank you. Councillor Smart. Good afternoon, everybody. Councillor Alice Smart, representing Army Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Trusswell. Good afternoon. I'm Councillor Paul Trusswell, and I represent Middleton and Belle Isle. Thank you very much. Councillor Wenham. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angela Wenham, and I'm representing the Wrong Hair Ward. Thank you, members. I will now invite our supporting officers at today's meeting to introduce themselves, and I'll start with Angela. Good afternoon, I'm Angela Brogdon, the Principal Scrutiny Advisor. Thank you, Harriet. Good afternoon, Harriet State Governance Officer. Thank you very much. And to the public, just to let you know that I would like to mention the board has agreed to nominate Councillor Post Paul Trusswell to take over as chair if I encounter any technical issues. I will now call on Harriet to go through the first five items for us. Harriet, over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so under agenda item number one, there have been no appeals. Under agenda item number two, no exclusions to the public today. Under agenda item number three, there are no late items. And under agenda item number four, can I invite board members to declare any um, disclosable CUNY interest today, please? Okay, thank you. And under agenda item number five, there have also been no apologies today, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harriet. Straight agenda number six, minutes of the meeting for the 9th of February. I know I didn't preside over that, but I have the permission to ask if we could approve that you've got all the minutes in your pack as the correct records of the minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of February. We have someone to move that, please. Yeah, I'll move that, Chair. Thank you very much. Right, straight to item number seven, hearing and balance center. This report within the agenda pack presents a briefing paper from the Leeds Teaching Hospitals NHS Trust on its plans to temporarily relocate the hearing and balance center. While this matter had been brought to the attention of board members informally, last month, the board requested to consider this matter in more details as part of today's meeting. Representatives from the Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust are therefore in attendance today to present the appended briefing note and address any questions from the board. We do have James Goodyear with us today, who's the Director of Strategy, and we've also got Deborah Hall, who's the Head of Nursing. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Could I kindly plead that whilst you make your presentation to us, we've got the public listening in, so it will be nice to... Um, keep the very technical bits of the presentation very simple so that those who are watching us from outside can understand 
and follow us through the conversation. So, Mr. Goodyear, take it over. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I will briefly set out the reasons um, that we need to temporarily relocate the hearing and balance service. Um, and then I'll ask Deborah to talk about some of the, um, the way that we've engaged patients in this process and taken account of their views um, in forming our plans. Um, so very simply, um, the Hearing and Balance Centre um, is currently based at the Leeds General Infirmary. Um, and uh, as um, members uh, will be aware um, and members of the public may be aware, um, we are in the process of planning um, two new hospitals at the site of the Leeds General Infirmary um, and demolition work um, to enable that has started um, and then there'll be um, a significant period of construction um, between now and 2026 um, when the new hospitals um, will open. Um, and the, the new hospitals will include um, an integrated um, hearing and balance service um, at that time. However, um, in the intervening period, um, there will be um, significant um, noise disruption from the demolition uh, and construction works. Um, and therefore it's necessary to temporarily relocate the hearing and balance center um, for the period of those works um, so that the noise sensitive um, clinical activities of the service aren't unduly affected um, by the, the noise from the demolition and construction works. Um, so uh, we've, um, in exploring um, options for the location of the service, we've engaged uh, with our patients and members of the public, and I'll ask Deborah to say a little more about that in a, in a moment. Um, but ultimately, um, that has helped us come to a decision to relocate the service to Seacroft Hospital, um, where uh, we currently have a capital scheme underway um, and we're investing around £1.7 million pounds, um, to create a new um, hearing and balance service uh, centre um, for the period through to 2026. Um, and we expect that this will lead to a much improved environment for patients um, and therefore um, a better experience for them until we can bring the service back into the new hospitals. Um, so if you're happy, Chair, um, at this point, I'll ask Deborah to just uh, outline the patient um, engagement um, that's taken place to date. Thank you very much, James. And Deborah, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so we engage with our patients uh, using our patient care and public involvement team. And we ran an event over a week in the department where we actually held socially distanced face-to-face -face meetings with patients on two of those days and the rest were given letters. Uh, we also publicised it on Twitter. There was an email address to feed back in, because obviously bearing in mind we talk in September, October last year, we were limited in how we could do a bigger face-to-face -face event. And uh, we had feedback from 33 patients in total and they told us that they wanted us to consider accessible parking when we chose a new venue, consider efficient signposting for the venue, uh, consider how patients with disabilities might feel about a new location and provide information to people. Uh, consider promoting our Red Cross uh, transport service. They help us to get some of our more vulnerable patients to the current Hearing and Balance Centre, and that's been very successful. Um, we were also asked about Wharfdale Hospital for patients living in North Leeds. We do actually provide a service out at Wharfdale. So for us, that was really for us to make sure that people are aware that that is, is an option for them. Um, at the time, we didn't know where the venue would be, but it, it has transpired then to be Seacroft. And I think one of the things to say is that um, the patients attend on average maybe every three to five years. So during this temporary move some patients may come twice in that time some others may come more frequently but actually it's not a regular attendance service so from that point of view uh, some of the patients fed back that they felt that that would be something they could overcome uh, because it, it's not a, a frequent uh, event. We've since sent out letters informing patients of the Seacroft move. We've sent out 12,000 letters. Um, a thousand of those are to children, you know, parents of children. 600 of those use our um, bone anchored hearing aid service. And then the remainder, which is 
10,400 are hearing aid patients. And so far, we've had just one patient since she lived on the Pudsey Bradford border. So it would actually become more convenient to go to Bradford. So it would appear that patients are, you know, have received that quite well. We expected contact through our PAL service or feedback as people have been attending. And that so far that that's not happened. We were very aware that sometimes we might get that feedback when the new service is in place. So we're not um, you know, expecting that we may get no further feedback, but that's been yeah. quite positive so far. Um, so that that's the position that, that we're in at the moment for yeah. the engagement piece. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I do know board members have got a few questions, but um, board members, I would just like you to note that um, we are asked to determine what, if any, further scrutiny action or future activity um, we would like to see being undertaken surrounding this matter. We may also wish to recommend to the successful board what, that it maintains for watching brief of service delivery and the impacts linked to the relocation of the hearing centre. So I will now call on Councillor Reagan to ask a question, please. I brought this to the attention at last, uh, at last scrutiny board that uh, although you've done a lot of consultation work with patients, we as a scrutiny board were under no, we'd not had any uh, interest in, or uh, you given us any interest into that this was about to take place. So we were getting, or I personally were getting information from residents uh, asking me uh, about this move and I hadn't, I hadn't been uh, contacted from yourselves via the scrutiny board to say that this was going to take place. So that's why I asked for this to be on the, uh, on the scrutiny boards uh, at, the, at today's meeting. So, we need a little bit more explanation about that because I think you know it's vital that we all understand if there's going to be major disruption and major movements within services where where we where, where it's got to take place. The second point that I'd like to make out is that yes, it is into um, it, it's into Seacroft and and I welcome that in the sense of that it's, 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 in, uh, it's in East Leeds and, you know, I'm a, I'm a champion for East Leeds services. But I think there will be issues. Uh, will you, do you envisage any issues from people from other sides of the city trying to get into uh, Seacroft as opposed to it being a centralised service? Thank you very much, um, Denise. Do you want to respond to that, James, if you don't mind? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Councillor Reagan. Um, the first thing to say is uh, to apologise that um, uh, Scrutiny Board weren't informed in advance of the um, patient engagement. Um, initially, we were exploring um, options to keep the service on the Leeds General Infirmary site, um, uh, and um, uh, that was through the springtime and into the summer, um, and it was only... Um, it was only latterly that we received the um, technical reports in, in relation to the, um, uh, the, the noise disruption um, and the structural requirements for the service, because some of the equipment is quite heavy, um, that we realised that we would actually need to look at off-site locations, um, at which point uh, we, we wrote to, um, uh, I, I think it was around that point that we wrote to the scrutiny board to advise but I appreciate that some of the um, patient engagement had taken place at that point. Um, and I apologise, it's certainly not our intention to um, wrong foot members uh, by not having informed you of our plans. Um, and uh, certainly we'll take that as a, as a lesson um, learned. Um, I, I'll ask Deborah to um, comment on the second point um, in a moment. Um, but I think uh, the feedback that we've had um, the majority of patients were um, uh, felt that the, the most important consideration in regard to the location um, was sufficient parking, um, which we are able to provide at the Seacroft site. And there's obviously um, good um, road access to, um, to the Seacroft site. Um, the um, Seacroft Hospital is also on um, uh, a number of um, bus routes, um, uh, which make it accessible for, for patients. And, and then lastly, where we do have any vulnerable patients, 
um, the Red Cross service um, very much assist us in, in ensuring that we can um, offer transportation to those patients to support them to um, attend their appointments. Um, Deborah, I don't know if you, um, <clears throat> if you wanted to add anything uh, in relation to patient access to Seacroft and whether we foresee any problems there. Yeah, sorry, I did lose my connection briefly there, but I caught the end there. Apologies. Uh, I think it is on a main bus route and there is a better parking. We, we do understand that for some people, you know, in different parts of the city, it may be a further distance to travel or require more than one bus. But uh, we've not had um, much negativity from patients generally. But I think, again, some of that comes back to the infrequency of attendance. But, we, you know, we would certainly uh, engage more with the Red Cross if we if to uh, do that to make it easier for people to access the site. Thank you very much. Councillor Reagan, um, James has apologised. His, his apology accepted. It is, yes. Thank you very much. I will now welcome um, uh, Councillor Elliot and Councillor Iqbal have just joined us. Can you quickly introduce yourselves, please? Yeah, Councillor, uh, afternoon, sorry. Uh, apologies for being a few minutes late. Councillor Mohammed Iqbal for Hunslet and Riverside. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Elliot. Thank you. My apologies to uh, uh, Judith Elliot from Morley South. Thank you. Apologies accepted. John Beale, over to you for your question, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, two quick questions, if I may, Chair. Um, the first is um, an ex uh, explanation. On page 18, it says that uh, most patients attend the department very infrequently, usually once a year, or more commonly, every three to five years. Now, more commonly, implies it's usually. So how can it be, um, is it once a year or is it every three to five years? That does need some clarification. That seems contradictory. Yeah. And the second point is clearly, um, if there was nowhere suitable in the city center for the new center, um, it has to be outside the city center. And it happens that there is a, a an appropriate location in Seacroft, which is northeast of the city centre. But looking at the outreach clinics, which already exist, none of them are south of the city centre. So it seems to me that already there is an inbuilt inequality in terms of geographical accessibility for people south of the city centre. Thank you very much, John. Um, James, do you want to come back on that, please? Well, if I could ask Deborah to yes, assist me yeah. with the point around um, the frequency of patient attendance. Yes, so I think uh, just for clarity, the, the usually once a year are the children and the three to five years are the adults. So it, it is that mixture. So some, you know, it is a, a yearly thing, uh, but as people get older, then it, it reduces. So some of the younger children, it is yearly, and some of them may progress to every three to five years, but adults, it's usually retesting at three to five years. Okay, thank you very much. And on the location, in terms of um, distance? Yeah, so um, in terms of um, location of services, I mean, we're, we're always keen to explore with community partners um, opportunities to um, uh, look at locations for outreach clinics in, in other parts of the city. Um, at this point in time, um, the, 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 uh, as I've explained, the, the principal reason for relocating the service was in relation to um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the sound impacts of the construction of the new hospital um, and to some extent we're reliant on um, the availability of um, soundproof rooms in the premises that, that we work with um, and soundproof rooms have um, uh, they're essentially they're very heavy and the soundproofing means that um, uh, they're uh, extremely heavy and therefore certain structural um, uh, requirements are, are needed um, and although we assessed um, a number of um, uh, a number of commercial locations that we might have been able to use, um, ultimately on the balance of the um, patient feedback, 
um, and the, um, the quality assessment that we undertook, um, Seacroft was felt to be um, the best solution, uh, which is why we've pursued that. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Beale, you happy with that explanation? I can give you another minute to ask for a supplementary questions. You're muted, so we can't hear you. Yes, I am uh, happy with that. All I can do is to ask whether some thought could be given for an outreach clinic to be set up south of the city, not just during this uh, time of the, the works going on, mm -hmm. um, building the new hospital, but on a, a more permanent basis. I think that's very fair and something that we can look at. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Councillor Elliott. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm in agreement with uh, Dr. Mayo. Um, we really could do with something south of the city. And if you would look into that, we'd be very grateful because actually Seacroft is an awful long way for people in my ward uh, to, to reach uh, Seacroft. Um, uh, Deborah said that 12,000 letters had been sent out. Could I ask Deborah, have you actually contacted everyone, sent letters to everyone who uses your facility? My understanding from our admin team is that that is everyone or almost everyone. I wouldn't want to say to you it's exactly everyone because there will be the people who've maybe moved or that we've we've missed and we're more than happy to do another you know, contact patients have received an update this week by text of a change in telephone number for, for the trust, just to make sure that is accessible to people as well. So, uh, and as we get new referrals, obviously people will be directed to the new service. Um, right, thank you. So you're using uh, letters and text? Yes. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to ask about people who normally go to the LGI for the service, but they live in the north of the city. Can they make use of the service out at Wharfdale Hospital in Otley if they haven't been to that one before? Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Truswell. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just, just a few very quick questions. But to begin with, I'd like to reinforce what Judith and John have said about access to the service in South Leeds, because obviously Inner South has a very low level of car ownership and bus connectivity to the rest of the city and out to Seacroft is not all that it might be. Um, could I very quickly ask how many patients we're talking about in terms of adults and children? And I suppose just for my own peace of mind, we, we're told that this is a temporary arrangement. Is that a cast iron guarantee that this temporary arrangement will not become permanent and that there will be facilities back in the city centre? And my third question really is on page 19, section four, the service location overview. It says services moving to Seacroft will be, and the second bullet point is all paediatric services. But then further down, it's the services remaining um, where they are and, and will be inpatient paediatric stroke newborn hearing care and assessment will be provided at Leeds Children's Hospital at the LGI. And maybe I'm missing something, but those two statements seem to slightly conflict with each other. Thank you, Councillor. Um, back to you, James. Thank you, uh, Councillor Trussell. Um, Chair, I, I should know, and, and I apologise, but Deborah will have to leave in a moment as she's due to give a, a staff member an, a, a, an award this afternoon. Um, so I hope that you'll excuse her and I'll do my very best to answer all the remaining questions and any that I can't answer directly, I will ensure that we uh, follow up by correspondence. Um, so uh, coming to uh, Councillor Truswell's question, so um, there are, um, uh, as, um, uh, as, as Deborah's outlined, there are around 12,000 um, patients that are currently um, be affected. Um, and of those um, uh, patients, we, we have around, uh, in, in, in total, um, see around 23,000 patient contacts um, per, per year. 
Um, I think uh, you're right uh, to pick up the point of accuracy um, in the in the report, uh, Councillor Truswell. Um, it should say that all paediatric outpatient appointments are moving to Seacroft, uh, but the inpatient service will remain in Leeds Children's Hospital um, at the LGI, um, as that won't be affected um, by the um, demolition uh, uh, noise because it's in the Clarendon wing, which is at the, the other end of the site, the uh, western end of the site. Um, and uh, in relation to um, uh, the temporary nature of this move, um, we are just in the process of appointing the architects for the new hospital. Um, and as, as, uh, as uh, part of that process, we have created a design brief, which essentially sets out um, the schedule of accommodation and all the clinical services which will be accommodated in the new hospital. Um, and that includes um, the hearing and balance centre. So at this point in time, our plan is very much that the service will move to Seacroft and then um, transfer back to uh, the Leeds General Infirmary at the end of the period. Um, and we do recognise that should those plans change, we would need to re-engage with um, the scrutiny board uh, and we'd also need to look at a formal consultation um, should there be any, um, uh, any intention of a, a more permanent move, but, but that's not the case at, at the present time. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions on this agenda, please? If not, we shall. Um, Deborah, do you have anything else to add before you run off? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. Best of luck. Thank you. Take care. Right. We're going to move on to our next agenda, and that's going to be on Leeds Fertility IVF. Thank you very much again, James, because I believe you're also still speaking um, on this agenda. So um, I will let you introduce um, your team. And to the board, this agenda is a report within the agenda pack that represents a briefing on, um, bear with me, sorry. Oh, so sorry. That represents a briefing paper from the Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust on proposals to explore and test the market for opportunities to grow and sustain the Leeds Fertility um, IVF. In, the, in, in light of this service, a changing competitive market in Leeds as well will be introduced. Again, we have representatives from the Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust who are in attendance to present the appended briefing note and address any questions that we would have from the board. So back to you again, James. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so if I can introduce my colleagues, um, Dr. Kelly Cohen, who's the Clinical Director for Women's Services. Um, and Claire Goodman, uh, who is the General Manager for Women's Services. Um, and uh, Kelly's going to give us a, 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 an overview of the um, proposals for consideration by the Scrutiny Board. Thank you, James, and thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to, to talk through our proposals with you. Um, so if I could just cite you on the context, Leeds Fertility Service is one of the biggest in the UK. We do over 1,300 cycles of IVF a year and 700 frozen cycles. So it is one of the kind of the, the largest in, in the country. It's also one of the most successful. We are the most successful unit in the, in the north of England in terms of what we call our, our take home baby rates, which is the most important metric if you're a patient. The national average take home baby rate is 27% and in Leeds it's 44%. And part of that success is that it's not just an IVF unit. There is a wider seamless integration of gynecology, of specialist reproductive medicine, as well as the IVF service that helps people to have babies. And the team have an international reputation for training and for excellence. So we've arrived at our current position because we want to maintain the excellence of the service and we also want to expand and grow it. And the commercial landscape for IVF in Leeds is changing and we've recognised that there would be distinct advantages to a collaboration with commercial providers. What we're hoping to um, talk to you about today is our, our hope that we will be able to invite the market to tender for the contract to deliver the IVF components of the service and we would work together with them to maintain the excellence as, as we've discussed. The driver for 
the proposal is really the emergence of purely commercial providers in Leeds, which is relatively new in the last 12 to 18 months. If we compete with them, then we already know that we provide an evidence-based service, it's patient-centered, it's highly successful. And obviously commercial organizations on their own don't necessarily, um, they don't necessarily provide that, that range of spectrum and that evidence base um, that we know we do. Companies are very keen to collaborate with LTHT. We have a, a really great reputation. We're a flagship unit and they want to grow their market share. So we're expecting interest in this from commercial providers. But what it gives us is the opportunity to expand across, expand access for, the, for our services across a wider geography. We would improve our ability to provide education and innovation. And also key is the investment opportunities that a commercial collaboration would provide with us. For example, we can invest with, with a commercial collaborator, we can invest in large bits of equipment and staff providing that high quality service that is used for NHS patients as well as patients who choose to self-fund. So what we know is when we've engaged extensively with patients as, as part of our normal business and Claire, who's my um, co-pilot in women's services and is a general manager, will be able to expand on the patient engagement that we've done. But what's come back at us overwhelmingly is that they're, they're, they are really positive about the service we already provide, but we fall down on NHS things like environment, like digital maturity, like communication. And they are all things that we feel would be improved by collaborating with a commercial provider. We, will, we would retain quality control, contact management, key performance indicators. We want to keep the service together on the same site. We don't want to lose our staff to commercial providers opening up in Leeds. We want to maintain that seamless integration. And the same clinical experts will deliver the care. So we don't anticipate any change in what our patients experience or the success rates that we're already delivering. I think just as my final point, I think it's really important to make the distinction about private patients. So Leeds Fertility provide IVF services for NHS funded patients and for also patients who are better referred to as self-funding patients, because many of those patients would say that they were victims of the IVF postcode lottery, where only one cycle is funded by the CCG. And we know that in Leeds, because they're so successful, that for women, certainly women under 35, we deliver an 85% take-home baby rate after three cycles of IVF. That's a huge, huge number of, of women. It's the difference between having a family or not having a family. And many of our patients will choose to self-fund because they're not eligible for NHS funding or they've not been successful with that first cycle. And we know that there's a significant trickle down effect of investment in resources because the, we already provide private IVF cycles and we don't distinguish between the groups. There, are, there is seamless integration of those care pathways. Whether you're NHS or self-funded, you benefit from that state of the art equipment, you benefit from that clinical expertise. And that's what we want to preserve and maintain and grow going forward. So I'm gonna, I don't know whether, Chair, whether you want to take some questions now or whether you want to hear a little bit more about the patient engagement or the actual tech. I think it will be good to hear all of it and then we can ask you our questions afterwards. Thank you. Is that Claire taking over now? Yeah. All right, Claire, great. you're welcome. Thank you very much for having us. Um, so I thought I'd talk you through two pieces of engagement that we've done. We do a lot of engagement normally with our patients. So we normally do quite an involved questionnaire once every quarter. Um, and we've reviewed the most recent information, which came out in December. Um, we sc score really highly across clinical care, communication, administration. Um, our patients are pretty happy with the service they already receive, and we get over sort of 75, 80% satisfaction rates in the, in the service that we provide in all those areas. But the things that come through in terms of where they think we could do better, is about ease of access on the telephone, navigating their way around quite a difficult, involved clinical pathway and being able to access um, expertise from the nurses at a time that's suitable for the patient. They sometimes find that difficult. Um, waiting times can, can be a concern at times. 
Um, and also since the pandemic, the feedback has been that although lots of patients really enjoy and like virtual appointments that we've been offering, some of them obviously would still like more face-to-face -face than we're currently been able to provide. And obviously the plan would be once the pandemic sort of peters out a bit that we'd be providing more face-to-face -face appointments as we go back into that. Um, we've done some specific engagement around this proposal. So we've um, there are a number of patients who've provided us with their details saying, if you want to come back to us after this normal survey to ask us specific questions, we'd be happy to answer them. And our patient engagement team at the Trust have contacted eight individuals who were happy to be contacted. And they, we asked a bit more detail about how they would feel about um, us having a, our care provided through a different provider, a commercial provider. I mean, the feedback from that was that people, our patients were really positive about the staff and the quality of care that they currently receive. They thought that some of the administration could do with a little bit of improvement. And they also felt um, that there could be a little bit more personalization of, of care. Um, there's lots of developments in the field now around applications on your mobile phone that link into the patient record, which um, enable families to navigate their way through that complex care pathway a bit better and I think patients feel that that's something we could do better but specifically about the question about having a private or commercial company potentially in collaboration doing this most of our patients said they didn't really mind as long as the quality of care remained the same um, and as long as the staffing was similar and we had the same expertise there. And as long as we didn't treat our NHS and private patients differently, and as Kelly's always ref already referenced, we already do that. We already have a seamless service and we'll, doing this, we would intend for that to continue to be the, the case. We, we don't want someone to feel like the care is different on their first cycle as it might be in their second and thirds. Um, but in general, people were fairly comfortable with the idea of a, a different provider running the service, as long as the quality of care continued to be good. OK, thank you very much. I mean, um, the stats that you have have written in the report is very impressive, especially in the um, conversion rates of up to 85 percent success rates. I mean, that is very, very high. And that's um, that's exemplary, really cut across the rest of the country. We know how um, difficult it is going through IVF from, you know, women who have gone through it, you know, people being in a position of wanting to be mothers, wanting to have children, people who are unable to have access to it and people who have access. So it's a combination of a lot. So thank you for the services you, you've been providing so far. The first question I would like to ask, and I do know a lot of members have got questions here as well. Um, you did say that, um, you will be outsourcing an IVM component. I want to know what specific component, um, um, Kelly, are you actually outsourcing? That's the first question. And then secondly, on quality between, between private patients and NHS patients, I know you did say they are seamless, and you also did say you've done a survey in terms of wanting to see what the quality is. What, what percentage of satisfaction did you get from NHS funded and private patients? So those two questions for now, please. Um, so I'll defer to Claire for the patient experience um, piece, but if we if we think about the services that we, and we, one of the reasons why um, it has taken us a little while to get to this point, we're obviously really, in terms of the decision-making, we're not yet any at any point of decision-making. So we're uh, hoping over the next few weeks to months to publish the tender. Um, but a lot of thought has gone into what we're exactly asking a commercial provider to provide. And the unit up there is a wider reproductive medicine unit. So. They see women who are thinking about pregnancy, but have gynecological problems. That is something that we would want to retain within LTHT because there is a, a wider kind of collaboration with general gynecology, with other, other kind of departments within the hospital. 
Um, they also do some very, very specialist fertility work. So some of the services that are provided at Leeds are only available in London, nationally com specially commissioned services, things like pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is where you are trying to predict whether a, a child or a baby would be affected by a genetic syndrome, for example. Those very specialist services, again, we will retain full control over those. What we are proposing is that the IVF, so when, when you're at the point where a clinician has, you've exhausted kind of all of the conservative measures and you are really your, your only option for a family is to have the, the, the kind of scientific technical IVF service. That's the point at which we would expect a commercial provider to take over. Right, okay. So we still maintain and keep the services we currently are providing. Is that correct? We wouldn't be, we're not losing any services at all over, from what we deliver now, but yes. the, the technical aspects of the IVF component, would, yeah. they're the ones that would be procured. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Claire, did you want to come in on the um, access to patients? Yeah, so we don't actually, this shows you how integrated, we don't distinguish between how a patient's care is funded when we do the patient surveys. Um, we have a 55%, 45% split. So 55% of our cycles are NHS and 45% are self-funded. So, but I couldn't provide you data on our patient engagement because we don't split it by funding stream. Okay. Just to add a typical day in the IVF unit, we don't segregate. There might be an NHS patient mm -hmm. next to a private patient how they follow each other through the same clinic. We don't have separate clinics for the two different groups. So it, it is truly integrated. It's very, our expectation is that their experiences are the same. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, uh, Thank you very much. Our, um, Councillor Knight, please, would you like to come in? Yeah, thank you. Um, I've got two or three questions actually, if that's okay. Um, so, so first of all, um, I'm not convinced that it's necessary because in, the, in your report on page 26, section two, it talks about how good the service already is. It's, you know, uh, already uh, valued uh, and respected. So I'm not sure what we gain by privatising an aspect, one aspect of it. I'd like to know more about what exactly will change there. Um, I'd, I'd like to know more about the actual contract that the NHS will have with this company, I'm assuming, that the NHS will pay this company a fee for their service. I'd like to know what that fee will be and how that compares with, with the, the, the investment that would be needed as an alternative um, if we didn't use that, that company. I'd also like to know, will that company have the facility to reject any patients it doesn't wish to take? Um, it, you know, that might be difficult. What happens if the, the, the um, service still isn't competitive with the private company. What will this private, the, the company that you put, um, subcontractor do about that? You know, because they'll be looking to make a profit, um, which is not really what the NHS should be about. Um, and I'd also like to know what will happen to the staff as well. Are they to be 2 paid over? Um, are, some, are they going to retain their employment with the NHS? How, how will they, they be affected? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to take two questions at the same time and then you get to reply. And then we've got um, John, Councillor Trustwell and Councillor Latti after that. So, John, please, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think my question overlaps with um, what Councillor Knight has just asked. Um, I just want to um, preface this by saying I have no objections to um, private um, organizations providing NHS um, treatment where the NHS is not able to prov either provide the service at all or not able to provide it in a timely and appropriate manner. Um, and secondly, I have no objection to the NHS accepting self-funding or private patients as long as that is not to the detriment of NHS patients. So with that, um, preamble. Um, on page 25, it talks about private clinics being set up in competition 
undertaking private and NHS work. Now, I assume that private clinics are only getting NHS contracts because the NHS is not able to provide that service in an appropriate and timely fashion. Um, and therefore, it is appropriate for the patient to be referred to a private clinic rather than receiving it in-house. But it then goes on. Over time, the increase in private provision can lead to a reduction in working NHS hospitals with a consequent loss of income and a risk that services become financially unsustainable. If we're already in a position where we're having to subcontract NHS patients out, and my assumption is it's only because the NHS can't cope with that number of patients, um, then if there's a private clinic, um, which in the past would have been receiving NHS patients, presumably the NHS can then uh, accept more of those NHS patients in-house and they don't need to go out. So I'm not quite sure what the implications, why it's a loss of income and risk, the services are financially un unsustainable. Okay, thank you very much, John. I want James to come in here to answer some of the questions. I believe I've you put your hands up. So John, and then back to you, Kelly and Claire. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, to um, deal with uh, Councillor Knight's questions, first of all, um, we want to explore this um, uh, uh, potential to work with a, a commercial um, collaborator subcontracting the IVF service to them um, to give us um, certainty um, uh, over the sustainability of the service and certainty over the quality and location of the service in the medium term um, in the face of a changing competitive environment. Um, so as, as Kelly sets out, Leeds Fertility provide a wide range of reproductive medicine services um, alongside IVF. Um, however, the income, uh, both NHS and private income from IVF services, contributes to the reproductive medicine service overall. And therefore it's important that we maintain the same or increased levels of activity over time at Seacroft Hospital. With private providers setting up in the city, um, the risk is that the number of patients who come to Seacroft reduces over time. Um, uh, and potentially that some of our staff um, would also leave to go and work in those private providers. Um, and therefore, we're seeking to try and improve our service to patients on the, the points that um, Kelly set out earlier around um, uh, some of the things that, that we perhaps don't do as well as some of the private um, providers um, around communication um, uh, and some of those other um, aspects. Um, so that's really why we're seeking to explore um, this um, potential decision. Um, on the second point, we would expect that the um, private provider actually pays the trust um, to take on this work. Um, and therefore we would have certainty over the level of income to the trust in a way that we perhaps um, may not at the moment, if, as I say, um, there is a change in the levels of um, patient activity um, to the trust. Um, we would have in place um, appropriate contract management um, processes um, so that um, uh, if there were any um, uh, need for dialogue between us um, and the, um, the commercial company, um, there would be a mechanism to manage that and main, main, make sure that the quality um, of the service um, was not affected. Um, so um, hopefully that um, provides some comfort in, in re relation to our rationale um, and the means that we would have at our disposal to, um, uh, to maintain the, the quality of the service. Um, Clary, I don't know if you would mind picking up the point about um, staff tupe. Um, yep. I think you're probably best place to answer that. Yeah, of course. So um, we can't tell for sure until we, we had gone through a tender process, but we would expect that the staff who are directly involved in providing the sort of scientific element of IVF care would be tupied if we went down this route. There are a number of members of staff within the within the team whose jobs cross because it's it's an integrated service at the moment they do reproductive medicine gynecology and IVF care 
And with those individual members of staff, we'd have to assess their contracts and the time they spend on the different aspects of that care to make a decision about whether their contract remains with Leeds Teaching Hospitals or is tupied over to a new provider. In those instances where somebody, for example, might be employed by the new provider, but is still providing some aspects of care at Leeds Teaching Hospitals, um, we, we would enter into agreement with a private provider to sort of um, pay for a bit of their time or verse, vice versa. So in general, most people would GP, but some would probably remain with the teaching hospital because of their um, involvement in the gynaecology aspects of care. Okay, thank you very much. I'll take two more questions. Um, Councillor Latty and Councillor Truswell. So Councillor Latty first, please. Um, Christine, are you still got your hands up or is that a previous one? Councillor Knight? It's the previous one. All right, could you take, it, take down, it down, please? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Strictly speaking, actually, it should be Paul. He put his hand up first, but I'll get in quickly. Just a quick one. Uh, I, I, I'm almost sure you, that you've answered this in, in, in a way. If I was going to have an operation, as like as not, I could have the same person perform that operation, either at the Nuffield or in the LGI. One place I pay, one place I don't, but I get the same, same person doing the same job, really. Is, are we talking about something similar or is this a completely different um, approach? If you, if you get to see what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. shall, I, shall I take... Thank you. I'll take Councillor Truswell and then you answer both at the same time, please. Councillor Truswell, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. I think we're having this discussion today basically because of the NHS's historic reluctance to fully fund three courses of, of IVF treatment. But one of the difficulties I'm having is really deriving from the report, the patient pathway, because I think the report to some extent is written on the basis that we all know how this works. And I, for one, only have, like most lay people, a general idea. So what I'd like to know is what is the current patient pathway, people coming through the door, um, and what will it look like in future in terms of who is actually providing the care to those patients? Will there be any significant or discernible change in that, in that pathway? Um, in terms of staff, Christine quite rightly has asked the question and part of the answer is that some staff may well tupe you across. But given the tensions that already exist between a private sector provider, whether they are partners or not partners, won't there still be the temptation for existing staff to transfer to the private partner, especially if that capacity is increasing? Um, and my final question, because several other questions have already been asked and answered, is, is the increasing capacity of this partnership that we've been told about being paid for out of what is expected to be income from private treatment. In other words, we've got a current service, it's obviously got a cost envelope. We're talking about a service which in partnership with the private sector is going to grow. Is that growth basically going to be paid for out of our, our, our pri private treatment fees? Thank you, Councillor Trustwell. Um, back to you now, Kelly. Um, so I think I'll probably defer to James around the um, your questions about the contract and um, but if we could talk about the patient pathway we would not expect there to be any difference to what happens now so if we're the part of the service that we are um, considering tendering is the IVF surface so if you're a, a couple um, who have been referred because you've not been able to conceive for a, a number of years then you are you are seen at Seacroft at the moment and you're seen by the medical team that is it's mostly consultant delivered up there. So there are a team of five consultants who are who work full time. Um, and there are a number of middle grade doctors, but actually only two or three of them. So it is predominant whether you're NHS or self-funded. So it is a little, bit, a little bit different to the to the Nuffield versus the LGI question, because actually if you're in the NHS, then you'll be seen by a medical team who may be junior doctors or a single consultant. Whereas at Seacroft, it's mostly consultants who do the, the work. 
Um, we run a hot week system whereby women who are undergoing the procedures involved in IVF are looked after by, um, kind of go through a week by week, very carefully controlled process of drug treatments and egg collection and embryology services where the eggs and the sperm are manipulated to form an embryo. Um, yeah. And all of those are again, there'll be no change in that pathway. So, and then the aftercare, which involves hopefully a pregnancy, the scanning, the kind of follow-up and the nurse-led care, what there is a lot of nurse-led care. Again, all of that will be unchanged, whether we are, whether we tender or not, because it's the same team delivering the, the same services. If, if I could add, add to that chair um, and want, want to make sure that I answer um, John Beale's question as well. Um, at the initial point of the patient pathway, when a couple are referred by their general practitioner, they have the opportunity under um, NHS um, policy and legislation to choose which provider they um, come to. Um, so under the Any Qualified Provider um, policy, um, a couple can choose to be referred to Leeds Teaching Hospitals. Um, but equally, they could be they could choose um, to be referred to one of the um, private providers who have already set up in the city um, to receive their care from them. Um, so, um, and and uh, um, that's really the early early part of the pathway. And I appreciate um, each of us will have our views on private provision of NHS care, um, but that's. Um, the existing position within legislation that um, uh, a patient and, and a couple in this, in this instance can choose where to receive their care, including from private providers. Um, because as Kelly set out, the NHS will only pay for one cycle of IVF, mm -hmm. um, uh, many couples will um, begin uh, with NHS care um, that care that's paid for by the NHS before then going on to um, uh, self-pay um, for further cycles of IVF um, so that they can receive the full three cycles that are recommended by the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. Um, so coming on to um, Councillor Truswell's question about the, um, the, the, the contract, where essentially um, we're looking at a, a position where over time um, with additional providers in the city, we might see a reduction in um, NHS care that's carried out at Seacroft Hospital and a reduction in um, private care that's carried out at Seacroft Hospital. Um, and therefore, we want to put ourselves in the best position possible to ensure that we either maintain current le levels of activity or ideally grow them. Um, and we think that we are best placed to do that by working with a um, a commercial partner for the, for the reasons that we've set out. Um, we'd be seeking to um, uh, let the contract for a period of 10 years. Um, so what that would do is it would give us um, the income certainty and the certainty over the um, quality of the um, service provided at Seacroft over that period. Um, so that, that's what, that additional investment from the commercial partner is what would help us to um, uh, sustain that service um, in the face of a, a changing competitive environment. I think it might also be worth adding that um, if we're successful, we do know that couples choose to go to other services that exist at the moment. Um, a lot of people still choose to have their care in Sheffield or in Manchester. Um, and they often go with, um, certainly in Manchester, a lot of the care that's NHS provided is, is provided by private companies at the moment. So the other hope, the, where the growth is, if you like, because you asked that question, um, the potential growth sits around repatriating actually, actually those patients. So hoping that they would choose to come to Leeds. Potentially they chose not to come to Leeds because it's not... Um, because that they preferred the, the, the more commercial services on offer in, in Sheffield and Manchester. So that's potentially where some of the growth might come from. Okay, sorry, I'll have to take one more question before we move on to the other agenda because of time, we've still got a lot on the agenda to complete today. So Councillor Iqbal, please. Can I ask Councillor Lati 
to put his hands down if you're not asking any further questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chair. Really appreciate this um, opportunity. Very pertinent question. Uh, I, I don't know much about it, but one of my constituents has raised this with me in detail. Um, you mentioned that you have gynecologists, but no mention of andrologists. Now, the issue is that um, he has been told that, sorry, we cannot buy the fertility unit, that we cannot help you because there's a problem with him, an issue. And there are, out of, con away from UK, there is a treatment for him, but he can't afford it, like culturing uh, stem cell treatment. And I just want to ask if that facility is available here in Leeds, and you say we, we have the best facility. Um, so without the individual knowledge, obviously, I'm sure you understand it's difficult to fully comment, um, but we have, there was, the, we do have an andrology service. Um, it was, that it's not delivered by a huge amount of people. It's obviously a very niche specialty, um, but they do have an expert attached to Leeds Fertility. Is your, is your constituent within Leeds? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it may well be, so the, the doctor, the consultant who delivered the andrology service was going just before COVID, was going to leave to um, go to the Cayman Islands as, a, as part of his career development. And so there was a point at which we were wor worried about the sustainability of that. But my understanding is that didn't happen because of COVID. So we have at the moment uh, an andrology service that is that should be functioning normally but I guess because of the delays with Covid and the fact that it's probably a non-urgent treatment that may well be he's not he's not had any update on that position but we'd be happy to look into that further for you if you want to direct him to us. Uh, certainly because just to finish off chair thank you for allowing me he's been told that the only option and solution for you is a donor sperm and he doesn't want to go down that route and he has communicated with other andrologists um, outside country and there is treatment like culturing of uh, semen and also the stem cells. So, okay, I'll direct it to you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. And what I would like to summarise with is if we can actually um, get an indication of when you will be testing the market, and I'm sure the board would want to um, keep a watching brief on the outcome of this testing, please. Obviously, I am aware we do not have any further meetings until June. So it will be helpful if we could have a written update to help determine the next steps for the board. Is that something that's doable on your side? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Thank you very much for coming. We truly appreciate your presence and the information you've given to us. And we would wait to see the written brief from yourself and obviously um, come back to the board and see where we take it from once we, you know, take it from where, when we get the information from yourself. So James, Claire and Kelly, thank you so much for coming and for your contributions. You. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very You're much. free to stay, but if you've got other things to do, I'm sure you would like to go, but please feel free to stay with us. Thanks. Right, moving on to um, our next agenda, it's Women's Health in Leeds. And this is a big thank you to um, Councillor Hayden for her foresight um, in acknowledging that International Women's Day falls in March. So March is our month. It's the time where, you know, we acknowledge the successes and the achievements of women, which is normally the 8th of March. So in foresight, Councillor Hayden wanted us to discuss women's health in this month. Um, the board has agreed to use its March meeting to specifically focus on women's health in, health in Leeds. Back in July 2019, the board did acknowledge the report on the state of women's health in Leeds, and it published, which was published in March 2019. That published a comprehensive picture of life, health, and well-being for women and girls. The report from the director of public health therefore provides a brief update on actions delivered following publications of the, of the state of women's health, as well as updates on specific areas of interest that have been flagged by the scrutiny board around breast and cervical cancer screening, maternal health, and reproductive health. It also sets out information on key health issues reported by girls and women in Leeds as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. I am pleased to introduce to you our new 
executive member for um, public health, Councillor Salma Arif. It's her first time on scrutiny board, just like myself. So can you all be kind to her? We've also got Councillor Fiona Venner with us as well. We've got Kath Rob, Director of Adults and Health with us as well. Victoria Eaton, Director of Public Health. Catherine Ingle, Chief Officer Consultant in Public Health. Tim Taylor, Head of Public Health. Um, Liz Wigley, Commissioning Manager, NHS Lead CCG. We also have Hannah Sowabats, the Health Improvement Principal, LCC. Louise Cresswell, Health Improvement Principal for Leeds City Council. We've got Dr. Sarah Forbes, GP and Associate Medical Director. And we've also got Dr. Kelly Cohen. So we've got good number of expertise for this topic today. So we are in very, very good hands. So over to you, Councillor Arif. Thank you, Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Afternoon, everybody. Um, so let me start by welcoming you, Councillor Abigail. Um, I, I, it's your first scrutiny, I understand. And like you've said, it's also my first scrutiny in my capacity as, as Cabinet Member for Public Health. So be, be kind, uh, which I'm pretty sure you all will be. Um, so I, I also want to uh, welcome this report in front of us that is focusing in on, on women's health in Leeds. As you've said, Chair, we've celebrated, last Monday we celebrated International Women's Day. Um, a lot has transpired in, in that week uh, with the tragic news of, of Sarah Everard's murder and obviously the subsequent conversations that we are, are being held in our communities about women's safety and, and rightly so. Now, this report was requested, as you say, by uh, Councillor Helen Hayden, the former chair of this scrutiny panel, to, to provide an update on, on key women's health issues. The request included a focus on breast and cervical cancer screening, maternal health and reproductive health. This report also includes information of the impact of COVID-19 on women in Leeds gathered through consultation and carried out by Women's Lives Leeds. In Leeds, uh, we produced a thorough assessment of women's health in 2019 and a recent engagement exercise has been undertaken by Women's Lives Leeds asking women about the indirect impact of COVID-19 COVID pandemic on women's health. I'd like to highlight the importance of really focusing in on women's health through partnership, data-led, community asset-based approach, particularly in relation to domestic violence, endometriosis and inequalities and widening gaps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Chair, I look forward to a productive scrutiny panel. I will now pass on to Catherine to introduce the report in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Ar um, Arif, and lovely to hear from you. Um, before Kath comes in, I would like Fiona to come in as well, and she will introduce uh, um, the paper as well. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Venner, over Thank to you. you. Thank you. Um, as is out outlined in the paper, we're very aware from local and national reporting that COVID has impacted disproportionately on women. This in includes an increase in domestic violence and the fact that women over the last year have been more likely to be juggling homeschooling and caring roles with trying to work. More women have asked to be furloughed to manage those roles, particularly homeschooling, and that's put them more at risk of redundancy. And it's in that context that we're bringing this report on women's health in Leeds and as Councillor Arif referred to it's impossible to talk about women's health without referencing the shocking and tragic events of the past week. The murder of Sarah Everard has led to an outpouring from women about how unsafe we feel in the world, how much we fear male sexual violence and male violence and the steps we take every day to protect ourselves from the way we're taught to walk, carry our bags, carry our keys, the way we text each other after a night out to make sure everyone's got home safely. And actually, we don't even think about this most of the time. It's just completely normal. It's mm. become second nature. But it has a completely corrosive impact on our physical and mental health and the way in which we engage in the world and our confidence and our sense of self. And one of the findings in in the state of women's health in Leeds is that women's lives are becoming more complex and that young girls, young women are more likely to experience mental health problems. And really it's not that surprising, is it? And for women who are in minority groups like black women and trans women, 
the oppression that they experienced in day-to-day -day life is magnified. And the report refers to some of this, particularly in looking at maternal health. The report doesn't explicitly, it references explicitly, but black women are four times likely to die in childbirth. And we focused on this at the last Health and Wellbeing Board um, when we were looking at the maternity strategy, which is referenced in the report. And we heard feedback from black women about their experiences, both of receiving care and also of providing support to women from black and minority ethnic groups around, around maternity services. And the report also references some of the specialist and innovative work that's happening in Leeds. I wanted to particularly reference Futures, which I'm very proud of with my children's hats on. It's an award-winning service that supports young women and young men under the age of 25 who've already had a child removed from them because there's a horrifying statistic that if you've had a child removed by the time you're 19, you've got a high chance of having three more removed by the time you're 30. And we know that the health and other outcomes of children who are looked after are poor and futures aims to interrupt that cycle because we realised that we were removing sometimes our own care leavers children, which is not a situation you'd ever want to be in. So futures very much aims to interrupt that and prevent intergenerational trauma and poor outcomes. Thank you. Um, Chair, and welcome to your first group meeting. It's lovely to meet you in this context. And with those comments, um, I'll hand over to Kath. Thank you, Councillor Fenner. Thanks. Kath, over to you now. Um, hi, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, my name is Catherine Ingold. Um, I joined the City Council in January as um, a consultant and public health lead for children and families. My post is part um, funded by Leeds Clinical Commissioning Group to provide public health input into population health management approach to prevention. Then we welcome the opportunity today to focus on women's health in Leeds. I want to be really clear, this is a system paper and response. It's not just about the council's work, and this is reflected in the number of um, contrib contributors we have here today um, to respond to questions the panel may want to ask. Um, so you'll, you'll have read the paper um, and the main issues really are topped and tailed by the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impacted on women's health. Um, in the paper, you'll see detail around um, cancer screening, maternity services, and um, contraception and sexual health. Um, it, and it's kind of tailed by what Women's Lives Leeds has found through their engagement um, around the disproportionate negative effects of COVID-19 on women. Um, things that have been mentioned before, domestic violence, childcare, homeschooling, care and responsibilities, working frontline jobs, um, ex increased exposure to COVID-19, worries about job insecurity, household chores, and the emo emotional burden of keeping things together. Um, since this paper has been written, as um, Councillor Arif and Councillor Venner have mentioned, uh, women's lives and women's safety have massively come into public consciousness with horrible events that have occurred in between International Women's Day and Mother's Day, um, and which are ongoing. Um, also, since this paper was written, the Office for National Statistics have published data around the differences of the COVID-19 pandemic on men and women and between March 2020 and February 2021. And the, these national findings chime with what um, was found uh, through the lives, through the work that Women's Lives Leads undertook. And so um, headlines are um, the number of coronavirus deaths um, experienced by men were higher in men than women. Um, there is a consistently a greater number of women than men who have been furloughed because of COVID. Women consistently spend more time on unpaid childcare and unpaid household work through the pandemic. Women reported higher anxiety, depression and loneliness than men. More men reported not being worried at all about the effect on coronavirus um, on their lives. Um, in the report, we talk about um, female life expectancy, which I suppose is the, the biggest composite measure of um, how, how women's lives are being lived. Um, it's, um, there is a gap in female life expectancy um, between the um, most affluent and most deprived um, deciles in Leeds. Uh, and this is widened um, between 2011 and 13. And when we have the most latest data, 2017 to 19, um, this marries uh, the trends in England 
where the gap is widening between the most um, and least deprived communities. And Leeds, the female life expectancy in Leeds, it, it is around one to one and a half years behind that um, in England. Um, and that kind of um, final outcome, I suppose, is, um, is created by the many factors that influence women's health. Um, and we require partners across Leeds um, to take action to improve women's health together. Um, so, so as you're aware, this paper has been produced um, by partners within the health and care and third sector system. And we're grateful to have so many people here today. Um, you've mentioned Chair Tim Taylor, Liz Wrigley, Hannah Sauerbutz, um, Dr. Forbes. We've also got Jeanette Morris-Baum, who led the work uh, for Women's Wise Leads. And we're also delighted that Dr. Kelly Cohen is, has been able to stay on scrutiny board to answer any questions. So I'm grateful to everybody from across the system to contribute to this paper and look forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, Victoria, would you want to come in? And I'm sure you've got all your team with you today. So it's over to you now. I've, I've nothing additional to add to what's been said already. I look forward to the conversation. Um, right. I, I just always like to um, acknowledge and welcome Catherine, um, as this is also her first scrutiny committee, and uh, thank Catherine for stepping forward and taking this, this um, broad piece of work on so early in her post. So thank you. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. The three of us chose March to do a first, isn't it? So that works really well. So thank you very much. Um, I believe Councillor Lay has joined us as well. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks. I've been here a while, actually. But hello. Yes, I'm Sandy, Councillor for Otley and Newton. Sorry. I'm thank late. you very much. Yeah, I missed you when we were doing the introductions, so I thought to call you now. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank All you. Right, good to see you. OK, so we've got two hands up. Councillor Trustwell, Councillor um, Reagan. Councillor Trustwell, please. I think Denise had her hand up first. And as a gentleman, I will. You're a good man. Thank you very much. Councillor Reagan. Lovely to hear chivalry is not uh, it's, it's not going out of the window, Paul. So thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, I'm really concerned about the inequalities within within Leeds about uh, women's health, and and as chair of the Inner East Community Committee, I'm more concerned about the uh, the increase in domestic violence within within that particular area. I'm also concerned about that there's uh, there's not the massive take up in screening opportunities for 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 women and girls in our particular area, and I'd like to ask. How are we trying, you know, I've been to many, many scrutiny boards and many health meetings and we're always saying the same thing. There's a big gap in the uh, in the life expectancies. There's a big gap in take up of services in this area. And I've yet not to see it, how we're narrowing that gap. And I think the gap's getting wider in, in specific inner east and in and in the south, and uh, you know, with the reasons that, that I've just uh, I just put out, and I think the the issue of not having enough community facilities for health screening, not having enough community health issues where uh, establishments where where local women and and girls can actually attend and say say what they're feeling and i think that's a, you know we we need to see some of more of that locally coming into the fold that uh, women can start to uh, express themselves and uh, say it, what it is that they would like to see in their areas so i, I would like you as professionals to say what we are delivering within Leeds over this next few years to see how we can narrow that gap. Thank you, um, Councillor Reagan. Very important. Who would like to take that from the team? I was I'm more than happy to take that. Sorry, I, I'm more than happy to take that from a cancer screening perspective, if that would be helpful. Yes, please. Thank you. So um, just very briefly to introduce myself, my name's uh, Louise Cresswell, Health Improvement Principal at Leeds City Council Public Health. Um, so I have a role in the city in terms of leading initiatives around cancer prevention, awareness and increasing screening uptake. And what's integral to everything that we do is, is very much um, 
responding to, to Councillor Reagan there around um, addressing health inequalities, to, so ensuring that we take a very targeted approach to everything that we do in the city around increasing screening uptake. Um, so we outlined in the report a number of programmes that we have in place at the moment in, in the city. Um, so to, to give you some examples, we, we've got the Leeds Cancer Awareness Service, the Public Health Commission, that very much takes a targeted approach, um, working in areas of highest deprivation and with specific priority groups where we know screening is lower. And the aim is very much to raise awareness and support people into services. Um, we've also got commissioned by the CCG primary care cancer screening champions again in the most deprived areas to go through their lists of people that are coming forward for screening and to do a bit of extra additional motivational chats with people and so on to really support people and understand what the barriers are. Um, and then we've also got Cancer Wise Leads, um, which is, is a programme commissioned by Yorkshire Cancer Research. Now, the aim of this is very much around, again, accelerating, increasing screening uptake. And we've got nine screening and awareness coordinators now linked to all the primary care networks across the city. Um, and in terms of, again, picking up that point on women not coming forward in particular areas around, for example, cervical screening. What these coordinators are doing is working with local women to find out what the issues are and what the barriers are. And, and to give an example of a piece of work being done in one PCN area, they've very much worked with women to understand the issues um, and to develop Saturday morning screening hubs. Um, recognizing what the issues are to women coming in sometimes it's women women of younger ages that are working age not able to come and actually that model's been so successful in getting people in that wouldn't usually come in that it's now being rolled out into other areas across the city um, through different different primary care networks so those are just some examples of, of some of the pieces of work that we've got in place to, to try to come and overcome some of those issues that were mentioned there Okay, thank you very much, Louise. We've got a few hands up, um, Councillor Trosswell, and then back to you, Kelly. Can I just come back on that, Abigail? Because that's only one part of my question being answered. There's a lot of other, other issues that I've raised that haven't been answered with, with regards to increasing domestic violence in regards to all the other things. Okay. Victoria, you've got your hands up. Is that to respond to Councillor Rega's question? Yes, Chair. Um, and I, I think I don't know if um, Kelly wants to come in too. But yeah, yes, I'm. I'm. Um, I'm. I'm really um, mindful um, that the question that Councillor Reagan's asked um, just really demonstrates the breadth of this agenda. So what? Obviously, what we've done with the um, paper, as Catherine has said, um, is specifically pick up on those three areas that the board said they were most interested in about cancer screening, reproductive health and, and maternity services. And so I think the report describes well what's happening with, with those areas. But as you rightly say, we were always very conscious that women's health is much broader than just those, those three services. Um, I think, um, that there's lots of people on the call that can talk separately about what's happening with their particular services. I think that the, 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 the point I think um, I wanted to come in on um, and the, the, the challenge I think we have to have to grasp as a city um, is, is, is how we bring all that together um, in communities. And I know this is, this is what you're asking. Um, so um, I think that um, this is very much about the, the, the bottom up work that we're doing, you know, in very um, targeted communities to try to pull all that together, as well as investing in some of those um, broad kind of asset based community health development approaches. Um, we've got better together and um, my colleague Tim's on the call who can talk a bit more about that. Um, but I, 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 I wanted to really make the point, it picks up on what Catherine said about um, the widening gap in life expectancy and the challenges we face going ahead. We know um, before we went into the, the pandemic that we were starting to see uh, um, uh, some reductions within the most deprived women in the city in life expectancy from the first time, for the first time since World War One. 
So, you know, lots of us pre-pandemic were having this conversation to say, this is about economic inequality hitting women's health disproportionately. And that's the issue we have to refocus back on. Um, we, know, we know coming through the pandemic that women's health and women, women's lives will be, again, disproportionately hit by all of the economic after effects of COVID. So um, that the challenge that we've tried to get across in the paper, um, which reflects the Women's Lives Lees report, is that unless we look at those economic um, impacts on women's health, we're not going to move this, this inequality um, on. So um, I, I think we can describe much of what's happening locally, Councillor Reagan, but I, I my, my view is that we have to do more and step that up because the challenge will be greater post-pandemic. Um, so happy to, to, to provide further information after the meeting, but I, I, I support your, your, your question and comment. Okay, thank you very much. I believe, um, Councillor Trustwell, do you want to quickly ask your question? We've got Kelly from um, Women's Light Leads and she would be able to shed some light. Um, on um, on their findings as well, that will help some of us and the questions that one people ask. So, Councillor Trustwell, please, and then Kelly. Yes, thanks very much, Chair. Victoria's answered one of my prime initial questions. Okay, that's about, good. The, redu about the reduction in women's life expectancy and that statistic, that crushing indictment of where mm. we are at the moment after 100 years. But the other points I wanted to bring in, there's reference to young women and the mental health issues that they face in increasing numbers. And a lot of these, of course, start at a, quite an early age. And I think we've rehearsed before in this committee, in the, on this board, the inadequacy in services available through CAMS and other services. And I just wonder whether we can get some reassurance that that has been addressed and developed. Um, the example going on to the uptake of screening services, of setting up Saturday sessions, is not earth shattering. I mean, it disappoints me that it even had to be discovered, because the simple fact is that people in, in, in wards like the one I represent, Councillor Reagan, that you represent, a number of others on, on, on this call today, Women are doing two and three, and in some cases, I know one, what, what, one woman in my own would four part-time jobs, all they're on zero hours contracts. And the fact that the scales have to fall at some stage from our eyes, that they need access at times outside the normal working week, I think is also implicitly, and I'm not being critical of anyone individually, but is a, is, is a real worry. I also wanted to mention the issue of how we support women from black and Asian backgrounds, for example, in the context of maternity services. 30 years ago, this, this council actually appointed four or five patient advocates whose role was to go in and support women, particularly from Asian backgrounds, not just as interpreters, but who had a cultural grasp of the issues. And that was a very successful service. I'm not saying that we could be in a position to, to resurrect it, but where is that advocacy role working on behalf of particularly disadvantaged women? And the final point I make, and I know I've banged on, but the, the, the genesis of this discussion about women's health actually goes back a little while to a referral that we received um, from uh, two councillors regarding the issue of endometriosis. And at that time, the board said, well, we can't just look at one issue. We need to look at women's health in the round, which is what we're doing. But it is somewhat disappointing that the only reference to endometriosis is one very short paragraph, because that continues to be a condition that mars the mental and physical health of so many women in mm. terms of failure to diagnose early, failure to treat and it's a bit disappointing that we haven't got a broader exploration of that issue that actually gave rise to, 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 to our wish to look at women's health in the first place. Thank you very much, Councillor Trustwell. Very poignant points. Um, Kelly, are you able to come in and then Councillor Venner, please? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. So um, I, for those who didn't meet me before, I'm Kelly Cohen. I'm the Clinical Director for Women's Services at LTHT. 
So I can, I've just been writing some down so I can pick up some of the points about both gynecology and maternity services because I manage both. Um, just around access, um, just to kind of give some reassurance about the work we're doing. Obviously every pregnancy is an opportunity for us to have really important conversations with the women of Leeds. Um, and last year we delivered eight and a half, 8,800 babies through COVID. We'd normally deliver around 9,800. And all of our midwives are absolutely cited on the need to ask specific questions about vulnerabilities and domestic violence. We've recently rolled out um, mum's ability to access her own notes and been hugely successful. So we have gone from a position where women had paper notes to us having computer electronic notes that they couldn't see, and they now are able to access that. And we were worried about, about our vulnerable families and vulnerable women being able to do that. So we've done specific focus work to check that they are taking up that opportunity, and they are. So that feels really reassuring. And what the next step from that is, is that it will allow us to roll out early self-referral to maternity services and to local GPs. So whereas now there is that access, as you quite rightly pointed out, counsellor women are busy, they are you know, exhausted and sometimes can't get to the doctors in the times that the doctors are available. So being able to log in or access my phone is, is hugely important and we'll be able to do that. I also want, just wanted to point out that the midwife group I, that you mentioned, the specific midwife group, so our Hamla midwifery group, and um, we're a specialist team of midwives who look after the most vulnerable women of Leeds um, when they're pregnant, won the Royal College of Midwives Team of the Year last year. So award-winning, successful um, kind of delivery of, of that really lo local targeted services to the women who need us most. And on that note, we have been really successful with our continuity of carer midwife pathways. So you'll see on page 37 in the Better Birth and the Transformation um, piece, which is, has been a hugely important piece of work that we've delivered through maternity services for a couple of years now. And one of the key deliverables was for every woman to have the same team of midwives look after her through the antenatal period, through the birth, and then postnatally to provide that continuity that we know improves outcomes. It's really difficult because there are lots of challenges operationally. We have, you have midwives in the community who've maybe not delivered a baby in the LGI for 15 years, who are now having to join a team and deliver all aspects of the pathway. So there have definitely been challenges, but we have been successful. Um, the ambition was to get to 35% before March 20, March 21. Um, because of COVID and because of staff sickness and shortages and deployment, we haven't quite got there. We're at about 25, 27%. But if we think about the black and minority and vulnerable groups, we're over 48%. So we have specifically targeted our continuity of care midwife groups into the postcodes where we know they need it the most. And it's a real example of, of kind of successful targeting to reduce inequality. Excellent. That's comforting to know, Kelly. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Venner, can I bring you in, please? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to respond to a few points. Um, first of all, with, with regard to domestic violence and abuse. So the new Domestic Abuse Act has just been passed. Um, it's just gone through Parliament in the last few months. It has a number of elements, including children being recognised in law as, as victims of domestic violence in their own right, in terms of when they've been in homes where domestic violence has, has taken place. In Leeds, we have a domestic violence and abuse dashboard that's monitored weekly, so we can see trends and patterns. And we have Marrick meetings four times a week, which is where the highest risk cases are discussed at large multi-agency meetings. We've got a bid in with the third sector at the moment to um, get some funding for additional um, independent domestic, uh, domestic violence advocates. And we have domestic violence specialists in each of the three early help hubs. We have mental health and substance use specialists as well. We have those three posts in the early help hub. Um, the Domestic Abuse Act, um, it's a really, positive piece of legislation and a lot of um a lot of women's groups and a lot of um there's been a lot of lobbying and campaigning that's that's made it what it is it, it contains certain requirements that are now statutory like um councils have to provide safe accommodation for 
victims of domestic violence or abuse, although it's not clear. We will get funding with that, but it's not clear what will happen with that after 2023. And we also did, hopefully people saw this, a domestic violence campaign from the start of lockdown. It was linked to the national You Are Not Alone campaign. It was in different languages. And also we're currently working with the vaccination hubs because obviously they're seeing so many people. So we're working with the vaccination hubs around them giving out information around domestic violence and abuse. So that's just a summary of some of the stuff that's happening in Leeds around domestic violence. Um, and there's a piece of work that's happening across the, um, the Children's Safeguarding Board and the Adult Safeguarding Board are working together uh, around this agenda. Moving on to Councillor Chiswell's um, point. So I chair Future in Mind, um, which is the strategy group that is overseeing the development of services and support for children and young people's mental health and well-being. And the Future in Mind strategy is being refreshed at the moment. It will be relaunched in April. It feels really timely that it happened to be this time that it needs to be refreshed anyway, because it means we can do it very much in the context of COVID and everything that's happened in the last year. It's very much done in partnership with, with children and young people. We have MindMate ambassadors who are aged 16 to 25. And the last big event, I think, that was at the Civic Hall before um, we went into lockdown, there was the International Women's Day event. There was also a big event about um, young women's mental health, which was primarily attended by mm. girls and young women. It was a fantastic event. And that has very much informed the future in mind strategy. There's a huge focus on support around mental health needs and in schools because the young women talked about that so much about not getting enough information in school. Um, there's information on support, access to support being more timely, the need to provide better support for parents and carers when they've got children and people with mental health problems. And also we have very much written the strategy in the context of COVID and what that means in terms of the increase of, ch of children and young people living in poverty and responses to trauma and services needing to be trauma informed because while we know some of the um, trauma that people have experienced in the last year through witnessing domestic violence, through bereavement, through isolation, we don't know yet, for example, what the impact is going to be of babies born in this period of toddlers learning to interact with the world in the context of social distancing. We don't know what all the psychological impacts of this are going to be, but going forward, so it's really important that the Future of Mind strategy focuses hugely on trauma and being trauma informed. Finally, um, I just wanted to agree that uh, endometriosis is, uh, is, a, is a huge health crisis really. And frankly, if men suffered from endometriosis, it would have been solved by now in terms of access to early diagnosis and to treatment. Um, I myself, um, um, I take medication to control chronic, chronic pelvic pain. I've had two surgeries. It's the biggest cause of infertility in women. Um, and it's, uh, you know, cyclical pain. Um, and the number of women who suffer from it and um, the percentage of women who suffer from it is, is shocking. Um, it, it really is an area that needs more research um, because the fact that it takes on every seven years to get a diagnosis yeah. and the treatment options, um, a lot of them don't work and a lot of them are quite horrific, like being chemically put into the menopause, full hysterectomies, et cetera. So it is, um, yeah, it's an area of women's health that needs considerably more investment and considerably more publicity. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Venna, and I couldn't agree more on that. Very, very true. Can you imagine if men actually had that? Councillor Trustwell, can you imagine? I've witnessed the women members of my family, so I've not witnessed, the, I've not experienced the pain, but I've seen all the impacts that Councillor Venner, which is why I brought us back to the fact that really endometriosis was one of the starting points that gave rise to our decision to, to look at women's health in the round. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, apologize, I apologize to everyone for being a man. No, that's all right. We're happy you're a man because we, we can't even imagine you going through that if you were something else. So don't worry, Paul, you're, you're OK. Right. I will now call on Jeanette from um, Women's Life Leads and I'll come back to Councillor Wenham and Councillor Elliot, if that's all right. Hi, thank you for that. Um, I just want to pick up on Councillor Reagan's points um, and also 
put a shout out for some of the stuff that Women's Lives Leads are working on in the very soon to come uh, future, I suppose, very soon to come. Um, in terms of um, inequalities in women's health, we are actually looking at starting a, a, a year-long campaign um, which will focus on five key messages. The first one, quite obviously, is safety, and there's going to be that's going to be a bubbling campaign that will go on until Christmas, at least. But then there's employability, well-being, healthcare, and voice and influence. So we are looking at um, running that through our Women Friendly Leads initiative, um, and the campaign is going to be full on. It is going to be in in people's faces. And um, it's a shout out to people here to become as allies and ambassadors to join us. And it's about asks and then what are you going to do and make a pledge to make that ask actually happen instead of just talking about it. But also, um, I just want to talk about what um, the third sector are doing in terms of um, the DV um, reach and communities. Um, I'm actually employed by Leeds Women's Aid, who's the specialist DV um, organisation in the city. Um, and we are, we are commissioned to deliver the Leeds Domestic Violence Service in partnership with um, Women's Health Matters and Behind Closed Doors. Um, but um, since lockdown, what we've been able to do as third sector organisations is work in partnership and um, grasp all those opportunities that are made available by the reconfiguration of grants by some of the big national providers like the National Lottery, um, Comet Relief, um, even, even more some of the, your, your, your more localised uh, police crime commissioner and even the Ministry of Justice. They've all been um, offering opportunities for us as providers to bid and bring in additional much needed resources in the city to, address, to um, address domestic abuse. Um, Leeds Women's Aid has been very successful and I think the only negative thing we've got to say about a lot of those commissions that we've, be, we've been able to bring into the city is that um, most of them are ending the end of March, you know, and that's something, so there's almost a bit of a cliff edge coming in terms of that additional money, that funding that we've brought in that we've used to sort of address some of those needs that you've identified with the figures increasing. We know from our own personal stats that we review every week that um, the figures, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna make sure I read this right because I wouldn't want to, um, our refuge accommodation is demanded by a factor over, over 30. So we're being outstripped need on what we can, we can provide in refuge. You know, we're, our, we've had um, a 50% increase last week or on the weeks before in terms of telephone helpline calls. We've had another 58% this week on last week on telephone helpline. We are just absolutely inundated and um, doing as much as we can with the resources we've brought into the city and, of course, the commission resources we have. Um, but, yeah, we are working on it. And also, we are now going to be heavily involved. Councillor Venner spoke about um, the domestic abuse bill, and um, Leeds is setting up the Domestic Abuse Local Partnership Board, which is chaired by Councillor Cooper. Um, we're actively involved in that, and there's a Domestic Abuse Voice and Accountability Forum where most of our women centred organisations will be involved to help contribute to. Um, that particular uh, need in the city. And then just on a final point about narrowing the gap in local communities, I'm gonna jump back to our campaign because one of our final key messages, and I'm gonna keep saying this, is ask us and include us before you decide. And it's, it, it's very relevant now in, in, in today, certainly after the last, last week's sort of um, unfortunate incident that's taken place where we feel we don't feel safe and we want to be asked how to feel safe in our own city so please and this is us working and a shout out to those local communities um, that we will be rolling out our campaign through our network of providers and through our ambassadors and through our allies to make sure we do speak to those women and young women in those communities and get their voices behind the campaign the campaign has been influenced by the women's hub the girls' hub, 
the City Listening Project, and of course the COVID report that we've done, which is all around women's inequality. So it is based on fact and stats that are less than a year old. So that's why we're deciding to move on this now. Thank you. Fantastic, Jeanette, thank you very much. I love the bit about where you say, ask us and include us before you decide. Inclusivity is key without us. Nothing functions, that's the reality. So over to you, Angela Wenham. All right, my question is about maternity. Black women is more likely to die in maternity in childbirth. Um, the myth is that they say black women threshold, pain threshold is higher than non-white thresholds. And until we get rid of this myth, nothing will change. Thank you, Thank you very much, Councillor Wenham. Would you like me to respond? To yes, please. Okay. Um, no, it's a it's a really important point. Um, as somebody with oversight of all of the risk incidents and the um, complications that happen in the maternity unit, I think that I feel reassured that our teams are well aware that there is no difference in pain thresholds and that everybody is entitled to. Um, the same level of pain relief, whatever their background or ethnicity. Um, we are um, trying, we are, we're kind of piloting a lot of different ways of improving access for our vulnerable women, because we know that particularly at St. James's um, during the pandemic in the early phases of the pandemic, there were a problem with interpreters and face-to-face -face interpreters and, and how to, you know, if you're already distressed and in labor and you also can't speak English or you've got other vulnerabilities, it can be really difficult to look after patients. And what we did was we invested in um, technology. So we now have interpreters on wheels little iPads that are instantly available and that's made a massive difference. So the feedback from our patients is that if the, you know, I mean, if there is a, a language barrier, then that's really helping. So, so we're trying our best to kind of deal with the different individual factors as we can, I guess. Thank you very much, Kelly. Yeah, the cultural factors definitely plays a different role in how um, we react to pain in the maternity ward. So thank you for that. Um, Councillor Elliott, and then we'll, um, Liz, you can come in. Right, thank all right. you. Um, um, what I wanted to know is how people who are in domestic abuse and in a, a violent household, how do they know where to find help? Yeah. Okay. Who wants to come in? I'm happy to come in from a GP point of view if it's if it's helpful. I don't know if it is. Thank I'll you, Sarah. Move. I've been sat still for too long. My lights have gone off. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in terms of how things would work, and I think it's the real strength of the primary care networks um, that we put in place services which are right for that particular community. So um, I can talk for our um, community, which is in Seacroft, and we have domestic violence workers that come into the practice. So that we can signpost as GPs, yes, there's lots of other services available, but actually it, sometimes it's easier for people to make an excuse to come to their own GP practice. So if we can provide um, domestic violence workers within the practice itself, um, that's often more convenient for, for people. And, and, you know, patients um, that are at particular risk, um, we would have their, you know, records flagged and the whole practice would be aware. So we would make you know, make situations um, so that it is easier for people to access um, access those kinds of services. And as, as I say, just, um, you know, we, we have uh, flags on clinical systems, so we make sure we ask every person. That's That's been more difficult with the pandemic because obviously it's not something you want to ask over the phone when you don't know who else is around. Um, but certainly for patients coming into the practice, then we would uh, routinely ask and, and signpost to services. Thank you very much. Councillor Elliot, I believe we also have a dedicated helpline in the council. It's an 0113246 number, and that's dedicated to domestic violence. So I can always pass that number to yourself. And we always also say 101, but um, we have a dedicated 
number for domestic violence for the council as well. But, that helps. How do people know that? Is it is it well advertised that number? Or I mean, I wouldn't have any idea until you've told me now. But um, how if people are wanting to go to their GP and wanting their GPs to know the trouble, uh, how does they find out where they can go? And also, I would like to ask, do we have safe houses uh, all around Leeds or are they just in the centre of Leeds? I'm concerned that uh, people living in Morley, for example, in my ward, I, I don't know if we have any safe houses in Morley. And I'd be very interested to know how we go about getting one or... or where where our people have to go from Morley. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Venner, did you want to come in? No, I was just going to say, is there someone from Leeds Women's Aid who's on this? Yeah, yeah. Would you be able to yeah. respond to yeah. the question? I know you. I know that the locations are not disclosed, but would you be able to just answer whether there's a citywide distribution of refuges? Yeah. Jeanette, are you still there? Yeah. I am, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, um, oh, yes, um, Alice just, has just put up the uh, helpline number in the chat for people. Um, we do take referrals and they are on a citywide basis, so the referrals will come in through um, the, the, uh, the um, referral processes. Um, just, just while I'm remembering, and it's, just popped up into my head with the uh, domestic abuse um, hotline number is that we actually now, for those women who are actually indoors um, and maybe just perhaps have their phones or um, uh, maybe a laptop or a tablet, we actually run um, a, a secure online chat function now, which we've actually funded ourselves as Leeds Women's Aid. So that if you can visit the website and then you can have um, a confidential chat with a, a, a trained member of staff about your particular circumstances. Um, we're running that. We've been fortunate to run that through grants that we've obviously get, got through COVID, um, COVID response uh, uh, funds. And we're continuing to run that um, as, as long as we possibly can. So that, that's, that's in response to how else can people access the services. But yeah, we um, it's centrally then, and we have we have um, three refuges, and we have a variety of dispersed accommodation around the city where women who are referred into the service can then access safe housing, and that's that's on a, a twenty four hour basis. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Um, Liz, would you like to come in, please? Oh, hi. Yeah. So just to quickly respond about the CAMS question that I think Councillor Truswell asked. Um, I think Councillor Venner has covered that really well, but just to say that the commissioning of that sits within my team, although it's not me. So I know our team meet four weekly with the CAMS leaders and they're very much driven in terms of their priorities for improvement by the MindMate ambassadors and the feedback that we get from young people. So we're very happy to facilitate a discussion in more detail outside of this meeting, if that would be helpful about CAMS. And then, um, yeah, I guess we're really aware that uh, the first thousand and one days of life are the most important in terms of determining long term health outcomes. So we have the maternity strategy and Kelly's touched on some elements of that. Uh, and the, the more finalised strategy will be coming back to the next meeting. So I don't want to go into too much detail, but we have recognised really strongly that um, addressing health inequalities and particular in groups of people from different ethnic minorities is something that we want to focus on over the next five years. Uh, for example, we know that if a woman sees a midwife before 10 weeks of pregnancy, uh, the woman and infant is more likely to have better long term health outcomes. So we'll be running a campaign um, over the next few months targeting specific communities where women don't currently access services before 10 weeks of pregnancy to work out why that is and work together to implement interventions so that they can access. Um, something else that might be worth mentioning is that we know that perinatal mental health and mental health of the, the mother and the partner has a significant impact on the infant's mental health and long-term outcomes. So we've quite dramatically increased the funding to our specialist community perinatal mental health service. 
who have um, a development worker focusing on particular ethnic minorities who are not currently accessing those services. And that's evaluating really well, but we'd like to increase investment in that in the future. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Dr. Bill, I believe you want to come in. Uh, thank you, Chair. I um, delayed putting up my hand because I, um, I wanted to make a general point rather than ask a question. Okay. Um, I, as I read through that report, uh, a list of truly shocking figures, but in one sense, there were no surprises. Um, we are aware of those inequalities. Um, uh, we had uh, last year the report of Professor Sir Michael Marmot, who look at, looked at inequalities on a national basis and found not only are those inequalities between various groups still there, indeed a number of them have actually increased mm -hmm. in the last decade. Um, following um, Sir Michael's report, uh, the Royal College of Physicians set up, no doubt in, uh, in discussion with uh, Sir Michael Marmot, the Inequalities in Health Alliance, uh, uh, an organization uh, for bodies to affiliate to. And if you look down the list, there are over 150 organizations who are, are members, uh, including, um, I think all the Royal Colleges, including a number of health organizations such as the BMA and the Association of um, Directors of Public Health, um, other health organizations such as Diabetes UK and ASH, Action on Smoking on, and Health. Um, Leeds has a very good track record of having as a central policy addressing inequalities. Um, and certainly some of the things which leads us down, and we've heard about this afternoon, have begun to make some improvements, but it's very clear that there is still a long way to go. And I would like to suggest that uh, there is just one major um, local authority on the list at the moment, that is Liverpool City Council. I would like to suggest that Leeds identifies itself on that national forum of saying, we are committed to uh, reducing inequalities. Um, and we stand alongside these other organizations in doing all we can as a city to make some improvements and work towards a situation where the inequalities between ethnic groups, between gender, between uh, social demographic uh, parts of our community um, are no longer uh, in existence. So it's just a suggestion that maybe lead city councils to join, join with Liverpool City Council and hopefully there will be other major city councils who are saying, yes, we are on board. This is a priority for all our policies. Thank you very much, Dr. Bill, and very well said. Um, definitely we'll be taking that on board. Um, what I would like to ask at this point is, as the board, would you want us to revisit um, women's health generally again in the future? Or are there any specific areas you would like us to recommend to the successors of the board? Yes. Sorry, who's speaking? Judith Elliott. All right. Yes, Councillor. Yeah, I would very much like us to look into uh, domestic abuse because we were told there were three refuges for the, for the whole of Leeds, it seems, and with 750,000 people at least in Leeds. And domestic abuse is now, uh, we know across the board, um, it, it, it's not just from deprived areas. And I think it's really, we really ought to be looking into that. <clears throat> I think it's, it, it's really very, very worrying. Thank can you I, very much. Someone can I come back on that, Chair? Just, um, I think um, what the speaker from Women's Aid actually said was there are three refuges, but also a range of dispersed accommodation as well across the city. So that might be individual tenancies, like individual flats or houses where victims can live. So it's not only that there are, there's the refuge provision, 
Um, the, other, the other point, just to reiterate, that I made when I was speaking about domestic abuse is that the new domestic abuse bill makes it a statutory requirement that councils provide housing for people who are escaping domestic violence or abuse. Um, and, and there's funding attached to that, though, only till 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Venner. I've also been advised that um, Councillor Anderson's scrutiny board has actually looked into domestic violence in the past and they continue to put that in their radar. So um, that's something that we could, um, Councillor Elliot, we could actually have a look and see how much they have done and that we're not repeating the same thing. So okay. I will... Sorry, perhaps they could report that to us. Sorry, I didn't get that. Perhaps they could send somebody to report that to us. Yes, that will be very helpful. Findings. Yes. Right, okay. Is there any other questions on this agenda? Anybody else with any questions? From the bottom of my heart, I want to say a very big thank you to um, all of you from the um, women's health team that have um, presented today answered questions, thrown questions back at ourselves. Um, this is our month and we couldn't have been speaking about this in any other time than now. So it was very timely. And I would like to say on this note to all the strong women out there, would they always say, may we be them, may we know them, and most importantly, may we raise them. So on this note as well, I would like to make a correction. Um, International Women's Day, the theme for this year is choose to challenge. And um, might be in error, Councillor Lati addressed me as, um, as Madam Chairman. I am actually the chair, there's no man to it. So I am called the chair and not Madam Chairman. So I chose to challenge that on this occasion. So thank you very much to each and every one of you for all your contributions. You're still happy to stay because we're here till four o'clock. And I will now hand over to Angela to go through um, the work schedule for us. Thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to this item, so the report within the agenda pack relates to the board's current work schedule. However, um, as the Chair mentioned earlier in the meeting, as it currently stands, there are no further formal meetings scheduled for this municipal year. And therefore, Appendix 1 simply provides an overview of the work that has been undertaken by this scrutiny board this year. So looking ahead to the next municipal year, a uh, draft schedule of planned meetings has been set out in Appendix 3. Um, these will remain provisional, obviously, and yet to be confirmed um, by the successor um, boards. Um, but for consistency, it is proposed that we keep to the current meeting arrangements, which are maintained in terms of holding meetings on Tuesdays um, from 1.30pm with a pre-meet at one o'clock. So already reflected in with draft work schedule are standard items of scrutiny activity that's linked to performance and budget monitoring. Um, so while it is important to acknowledge that the future work schedule will become the responsibility of the successor scrutiny board, Board members today are invited um, to consider and identify any other specific areas or matters that it would like to recommend to the Success Scrutiny Board in terms of its future work programme. Um, so I'll pass back to you now, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. And do we know our next date, meeting time and date, please? Yes, in terms of it needing to be confirmed, it is provisionally scheduled for Tuesday, 15th of June. Okay. Month. Excellent. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of our uh, meeting today. Anyone got anything you'd like to say or ask? Me, Abby? Yes, mm -hmm. Councillor Knight. So um, is the Leeds Fertility and IVF situation on the agenda? To, is it coming back to board? Because I think it needs to. I think there were a lot of questions that weren't answered, to be honest. Yeah, we could do. Remember, I did ask that, you know, we would like some briefings from yeah. them going forward to assist the board in, um, uh, in yeah. our decisions going forward. So, yeah, we definitely. Sooner rather, sorry, I would suggest sooner rather than later. There's no point. Okay. In, you know, after the horse has bolted. Yeah. It would, it would be pointless. It'd be good to, um, yeah, investigate that again before it actually goes ahead. Agree. Thank you okay. very much. No, Thank sorry. you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Harrington. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to ask if we could have a look at um, plans for returning to normal type GP surgeries and hospital service delivery. 
um, as we move out of the COVID-19 situation. Okay. Um, because I'm concerned about the, the people talking to me saying, well, it's okay, it was hard enough to get an appointment with a GP before, but mm -hmm. now it's virtually impossible because it's all telephone triage, et cetera. And I understand totally the reasons for that, but I want to know how we're actually, how Leeds GP Confederation, how the hospitals, et cetera, are looking to plan to come out of that process, please. So if that could be considered at a future board meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor. Noted. Anyone else would like to say anything? Right. Thank you for a whole year's worth of hard work. And our next meeting will be June. So um, you will be informed of what's going to happen and who will be taking over from, depends on who comes in. So. Thank you all for attending, to all our chief officers who have come, to all our guests, to all the exec members and to all members of the board. Again, thank you from the bottom of my heart and have a lovely day. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.